Now we're looking at Greek mythology. To, uh, yeah, for this look at Greek mythology, I want to focus pretty much on just two things. Uh, the creation account, and you know, kind of the turmoil that happened thereafter, and the uh, four races of, of humanity. Now I think these two things are pretty telling as, as to what the ancient, as to what, in what the ancient Greeks had faith. So for these ancient Greeks, in the beginning, there was emptiness. Chaos is another word for it. Now, I'm not sure exactly what we should read into this as far as the nature of this chaos, but uh, these two words are pretty telling right from the beginning. In fact, they sound a lot like something we've heard before. They sound a lot like ancient Egypt. Okay, so in the beginning, there was this emptiness, this chaos. But what came forth from the emptiness were three gods. Gaia, the earth, Tartarus, the under-earth, or the underworld, and uh, Eros. And Eros is love. Now we shouldn't think necessarily like erotic, right? So yeah, okay, so it's the same root of the word, but uh, this Eros is beauty, is the love that inspires creation, right? This, this absolute joy that goes forth, and from this, you're impelled to make. <laughs> it's, you know, maybe inspiration is maybe not even a terrible word either, but inspiration for beauty, inspiration to create. Okay? It's probably the same feeling, if you can imagine this, the same feeling that's either shared or combined uh, with both the parent and the artist, right? The one that's inspired to create life. Now, this, you know, Eros is, is really cool. Unfortunately, we don't hear too much about Eros to the rest of this reading. I wonder if in the original text, Eros is either mentioned or in the background or, or something, but that, that to me is a curiosity. Okay, so in the beginning we have Gaia, we have Earth, Underworld, and Love. Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros. Now from herself, uh, Gaia gives birth to Sky. And she gives birth to Sky. She also gives birth to mountain and sea. Aria is mountain, Pontus is sea, and Uranus is sky. Now she only marries Sky. <laughs> only Uranus becomes her equal. And Uranus, Sky can be found wherever Earth can be found. She elevates sky to her equal. Wherever you find earth, you'll find sky. Okay. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. <laughs> now, uh, Gaia, uh, earth and sky, Gaia and Uranus, have children. The first set of children they have are giants. And these are hundred-handed giants, and they're incredibly strong. It's probably what that hundred-handed means, is they're very, very strong. Uh, and then they also give birth to cyclops. They have the single eye, and they're excellent craftsmen. Now, the single eye, if I had to guess, probably means something like singularity of vision, right? So these guys are focused on creating, you know, the, you know on this craftsmanship. They're, they're excellent craftsmen. That's just a guess. I don't really know. So we have the hundred-handed giants, three of them, and we have the cyclops, another three. Now, Uranus hates and despises these six kids. He fears their strength. Is, is, is the phrase in the book. He fears their strength. Fear probably fears what they can do. Maybe even fears that they can court Gaia's love. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just taking a guess here. So he fears his these six children, and uh, out of this fear and loathing and hatred, he throws them to the depths of the underworld. They fall for nine days, and they land on the tenth. I don't know <laughs> how, how far that, that could be, but that, that's a really deep death, to fall for nine days. Uh, I don't know exactly how long it takes to fall from, say, the top of the Empire State Building, but I gather it's only a matter of a few minutes or, or something like that. So you can imagine how, fall, how far these uh, giants had fallen. 
So, you know, Gaia, understandably, is miserable about this. You know, these are her children. Right? She loves her children, regardless of their appearance. Uh, so, uh, she, you know, in the text says she buries these feelings in her heart. Right? Uh, and she has more children. Right? She loves having kids. Or she has more children. And this time they give birth, uh, Uranus and Gaia, they give birth to the Titans. There's 13 Titans altogether. Now, at some point, Gaia gets her children together, these Titans together, and says, look, you know, your uncle, your, uh, your, your brothers, right? your brothers are trapped in the bottom of Tartarus. They've been imprisoned by Uranus. Now, I can't stand this. They have to be rescued. You have to bring them home. Who, is, who of you is going to do it? Who of you is going to be strong enough to do it? And all the Titans are basically kind of hesitant, at the very least, if not outright afraid, of their father Uranus. Only Kronos, and the text says, is most like his father. Only Kronos uh, is willing to do this, is only willing to defeat Uranus. Now there's difficulty here because Uranus is immortal, it can't be killed. So instead of killing Uranus, Kronos takes the, according to the text, the source of his power, which, uh, you know, uh, he emasculates. Uh, uh, he emasculates Uranus. Yeah, Freud would be happy and proud of this phrase, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Kronos emasculates Uranus, takes away his power, right, and throws the uh, phallus into the sea. So, you know, at first, uh, you know, Gaia is really thrilled about this because, all right, her children are going to be her brother. Her, her first six sons are going to be free. But Kronos, being like his dad, he's afraid of the giants as well. And he takes his dad's place as the god of the sky, marries his sister Rhea, who's a lot like Gaia, and uh, continues along his merry way. Now, Gaia is not pleased with this, but again, she probably just buries her feelings in her heart. Holds a grudge, is another way of saying it. So Gaia, oh, that's right, yeah, she curses, right? She curses uh, Kronos with a prophecy saying, okay, well, since you didn't help me, just like you defeated your father, uh, your son's going to defeat you. That's what she said. So Kronos, um, you know, kind of ignores this for a bit, and he marries, or he begins having children with his sister, Rhea, who's a lot like Gaia. Uh, but, you know, kind of a problem arises. Now, you know, uh, uh, Rhea and Kronos start giving birth to the gods, right? the Greek gods. Yeah. At this point, so we had... Uh, Gaia, Uranus, uh, well, Gaia first, oh, sorry, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros first, then Gaia from herself gives birth to uh, Uranus, uh, Uriah, and Pontus, sky, mountain, and sea, and through the marriage of uh, earth and sky, they give birth to the Titans, but now the Titans are having their own children, and these are the gods, and these are the Greek gods. So these Greek gods, um, you know, Rhea begins to give birth to the Greek gods, and kind of, you know, at first, Kronos is, is thrilled that he has children. So each time Rhea gives birth to a child, she brings the child to Kronos. He's like, oh, my lovely little child, we have a beautiful baby. But then he remembers the prophecy. He remembers the prophecy, and it just goes insane. Now, you know, oh, this kid's going to kill me. And so, oh, eats the kid. Um, you know, and then, you know, since Kronos is now the god of the sky, he's got a big mouth, right? He can swallow up everything. <laughs> he's huge. Uh, and, you know, this upsets Rhea. But, you know, she's, you know, and, and this upsets Kronos, too, right? He apparently has something of a conscience. And he, but he still loves his wife, so they still have more kids, more kids, right? Uh, but each time Rhea brings the child to Kronos, uh, he goes insane and he eats the kid. Uh, this is kind of scary. Now, um, by this time, Rhea is really upset with her husband, Kronos, and she goes to uh, both mother and mother-in-law and says, Gaia, you got to help me here. Uh, he keeps eating my children. You know, you've dealt with a bad husband before. How would you deal with this? <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, so Gaia says, look, here you gotta trick Kronos, right? Now, fortunately, this is gonna be easy because he goes crazy. But you gotta trick Kronos. And you trick Kronos by giving him a stone instead of his son. But he won't know the difference if he just swallow the stone. Okay. So this is what happens, right? Rhea 
gives birth to Zeus, her last son, and kind of hides him away off on an island. And Cronus says, where's my new child? I'm hungry. Where's my new child? So uh, Rhea brings the, you know, brings the stone to Cronus, and he goes insane. He's like, oh, this is a kid. This kid's going to kill me. Oh, swallows the stone. He doesn't know the difference, right, because he's insane. Okay. Well, and now Zeus is raised to maturity, and uh, at one point... Uh, Zeus colliding, uh, sorry, colluding with both Gaia and Rhea uh, gives Kronos uh, a poisonous drink, right? Kronos, Kronos is like, hey, thanks for the drink. Wait, who are you? <laughs> so, oh, you look suspicious. Um, but it's too late. You know, Kronos drinks the drink, and this causes him to vomit. And Kronos vomits up all you know, the stone and all of Zeus's siblings. And then Zeus declares that, look, you, you know, you got to give up power because you're crazy, you're mad, you're insane. Uh, and, you know, Gaia's kind of in the background prodding my lawns, like, you know, rescue the uncles. And Rhea's like, you know, rescue the young uh, They're They're all uh, uh, kind of prodding Zeus along at this point. They, 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 the, all the gods, all his siblings, all of Zeus's siblings are backing his play here. It's like, yeah, you got to go. You're nuts. Well, Kronos uh, rallies the Titans together. And uh, there's a huge battle starts. There's a huge battle after this. Uh, now there's a difficulty in having a battle amongst the immortal. Right? Nobody dies. <laughs> Nobody can be killed. So, uh, you know, the most he could do is imprison or outwit or, or you know, give, you know, get, get the other person, the other immortal person to give up. Right? But none of this really seems to be working. Until Zeus, uh, you know, again, prodded, prodded along. Uh, gets the idea to release his uncles, release the hundred-handed giants and the cyclops. Okay. So he, he goes to make a deal with them. Says, "Look, I'll release you." And you know, you know this you know this Chrono, you know Uranus, and then Chronos following him. They both have imprisoned you, and I will release you if you fight for me. And the giants and the cyclops, like, yeah, this is an easy choice. Yeah, sure. And so they fight. On the side of uh, on the side of uh, uh, Zeus, and the hundred-handed giants, you know, open up this great rift, and they throw Kronos down there, and he's imprisoned, and that's how Zeus, and that's how Zeus uh, acquires, or, you know, defeats his his father Kronos, and uh, he and his two brothers Poseidon and Hades, uh, they draw lots for uh, you know who has dominion over what. And Zeus has dominion over uh, the sky, uh, Poseidon has dominion over the sea, and Hades has dominion over the underworld. And that's the rise to power, uh, the creation of the universe and the rise to power of Zeus. Zeus teaches uh, humans, humankind, about justice and society. Uh, Poseidon teaches them about horsemanship, which is probably a, you know, maybe it's a euphemism for all the trades maybe is kind of the idea. So horses were used a lot in craftsmanship and agriculture. And then Hades teaches um, mankind, humankind, uh, about respect for the dead. Respect for the dead. And that, you know, again, that kind of, those are some major components to society, right? Justice, how to interact with each other, craftsmanship, how to make a living, and honoring the dead, how to remember not only who came before you, but what they did. History. Okay. Uh, so this is how the Greeks envisioned the beginning of the universe out of chaos to our society. So like the uh, you know Babylonian mythology, right, the Universe is, is one of turmoil, right? Um, you know, for the you know for the Greeks, the universe is one of turmoil. There's a lot of fighting happening, and it all ends well, in, in, you know, because they've established society now. But there's a lot of fighting, conflict up before them. You know, okay, yeah, there's conflict, but the Greeks aren't like the Babylonians in this regard. Um, they, there's a reason for the conflict. There's a reason for the strife. Right? And there's a reason why one person or group is the victor over the others. 
So if you take a careful look, you know, what's going on here? The, the whole term wall is started because Uranus uh, um, hates his kids. He doesn't love them for who and what they are. That's what starts all this turmoil to begin with. And, you know, Gaia is opposed to Uranus because she loves her kids, because she loves her children. And she never, you know, really in some important ways, she doesn't turn against anybody until they go against the family. She doesn't turn against anybody until they go against the family. She uh, turns against Uranus, holds a grudge in his heart, only when he imprisons her kids and never lets them go. She turns against Kronos, her own son. Uh, she turns against Kronos only when, you know, she supports Kronos because he's going to help, uh, uh, you know, he's going to help uh, the giants and the Cyclops. But she turns against them, like against him, when he turns against them. Gaia loves everyone. Until you go against the family. And you know, people, you know, these gods, these immortal beings, are not the enemy until they go against the family. Right? The, the, judging from the mythology, these hundred handed giants, they're probably ugly. Same thing with the Cyclops, they're probably ugly. Right? They're not beautiful, wonderful creatures to love in and of, you know, in and of themselves. No way. But Gaia loves them, and she'll fight for them. You know, Zeus comes to power because he supports his mother, because he wants to free his uncles, because he wants to fight against the tyranny of his insane dad. Yeah. You know, the, most of the motivations happening here have to deal with family. What is good is fighting for the family. And what's bad and what's deserving punishment and, you know, <clears throat> amputations of various kinds is turning against the family. Heck, even, you know, when uh, Kronos emasculates Uranus, right? Well, why, why this? Well, yeah, you know, again, Freud would be proud of this, this and <laughs> this description and saying, you know, the, you know, the phrase in the text is, you know, Kronos says, I have removed your power. Yeah, but power for what? Right. Kronos still has arms. You know, leaving aside the, you know, the uh, uh, the psychology and, and you know, talking about various masculine motivations, right? R power for what? Well, that power, right? What was removed was the power to create family. Hmm? This is the source of power, is creating family. Gaia is really the most powerful of them all. And why? Because she creates family. She even started creating family on her own without anybody else. <laughs> and, you know, even Zeus, the, uh, you know, kind of the triumvirate of the, <laughs> the three gods that rule over everything after all the fighting, Zeus, Poseidon, and, and Hades, well, it's family that's in control of everything. It's sky, sea, underworld. So uh, this seems to be a major motivation for these gods is family of love. It's the source of power, family of love. It's also the source right, when you it's a source of condemnation when you fight against the family or betray the family. You're in trouble. So let's take a look at the races according to Greek mythology. So the first race is the race of gold, right? the race of gold. Now the race of gold, uh, kind of like perfect people, they get along well with each other. They care about each other. They don't fight. They look after each other. They treat each other with goodness and wisdom, and well, really, kind of like family. They don't fight. They don't bicker. They don't have violence against each other. They look out for each other. Now this uh, race, according to the Greek mythology, they had no enemies. You know, why would they? They're nice. <laughs> the weather was warm and pleasant. They could simply live off the land. Literally, they didn't have to farm. They just kind of walk out and 
get their sweet, wonderful foods. They didn't have to worry about uh, snow or rain, uh, intense heat, anything like this. And so they didn't even bother making shelter or clothes, right? They were just lived in blissful care because they cared about one another. They never had any enemies, uh, but they did still eventually die off, but they died in peace. They died in peace. They, uh, in their, and in dying in peace, they, um, their spirits lived on in, in, in the mists. Right? And they looked, and they cared so much that they gave advice and protection uh, to other people, uh, even from beyond the grave. Well, next we have the race of silver. And the race of silver were not as noble and as wonderful as the race of gold. Um, they weren't particularly violent or anything like this, but they happened to be selfish or immature. They were basically like children, I think might be fair to say. In fact, you know, one portion of the text it says that you know, the children didn't really move out of their parents' houses <laughs> or their parents' homes, anyway. Um, they tended to just want to have things taken care of for them. They didn't want to take care of them for themselves. They didn't want to take care of people they only wanted to be taken care of. Right? They were selfish, thinking only of their own needs and wants. So, uh, as punishment, the gods gave them harsh weather. So they had to start farming, they had to build homes, uh, and you know they kind of grew old and died. Right? They grew old and died. And their bitter souls <laughs> traveled down to uh, Tartarus in, in, the, in the underworld. And you can kind of imagine they're just kind of sitting there sulking and crouching and, and you know, being upset that they didn't get what they wanted. Well, now we have the race of bronze. Now, bronze uh, was used in war. It was used to make weapons. And these bronze, this race of bronze, their <coughs> hearts were as hard and as bitter as uh, the bronze that they wielded. And they fought, right? They loved Ares. They didn't love love. Right? They loved conquering. They loved beating down others. Now, this race died off very quickly because what happens when you have 20 people in a room who want to Defeat anybody and everybody else. Right? Chances are no 20 are going to live. Right? Uh, so this race of bronze, they died off pretty quickly. And uh, they also, uh, their uh, afterlife is also rather miserable and hate-filled, trying to kill from beyond the grave. Now we have the race of heroes. The race of heroes were more noble than either silver or bronze. Uh, they fought, but they fought in defense of others. They fought for the sake of others. They were warriors. They were um, clever. They were wise. And uh, you know they, they fought, and not all survived, but those that did uh, were allowed to basically go off and live on a wonderful, blessed little island, and they live in the glory of their conquests. Right? They fought on the side of good, they won, and they basically get to, to live on their lives, uh, you know, toasting themselves, right? you know, reliving their battles and story and song. And you know, even in this case, uh, Zeus took Cronus and made him in charge of this island. I imagine Cronus is in charge of nothing else. Right? They made Cronus in charge of the sun and kind of in charge of the happiness of the heroes. Now the last race mentioned is the race of iron. Race of iron. Now the race of iron, these are people who care about wealth. They care about land. They care about property. They care about things, not people. Now, according to uh, the story, uh, the gods haven't eliminated them yet. Yet, when you have a group of people who don't really care about anybody else, they only care about things, uh, how much, you know, to kind of put this together, how much is actually done for the sake of others? Well, really not much of anything, right? Uh, you care about things, not people. And you know, just like you put a room, say you're putting in a room, uh, 20 people in a room, all they want to do is fight, they're going to quickly die off. 
Well, the race of iron, they're probably, you know, got 20 people in the room, they only care about wealth. They're probably not going to die off very fast, but they're not going to thrive either, right? Um, they're trying to divvy up the wealth, as much wealth as they can amongst the fewest number of people. Well, chances are that's not going to be most of them, or <laughs> maybe even just one. Um, that's not a thriving society. That's not a society that is happy or a society that can last. Now, in accordance with mythology, sure looks like the gods are going to eliminate that. Hasn't happened yet. We're still all around. But the gods probably won't put up with it forever. So we've taken a look at the um, at the gods, right? the creation account, and you know, kind of the turmoil there. And we've even taken a look at these these various races according to the Greek mythology. So now you get to the point. It's like, well, and what exactly do the ancient Greeks have faith? Well, it, it's it's easy to miss. Right? It's easy to miss. Um, it's easy to miss because in what they have faith was mentioned once. In this passage, at least explicitly, and then kind of ignored. Uh, they have faith in Eros. They have faith in Eros. Eros, this beauty, inspires creation, inspires life. Right? Uh, Eros is responsible for family, right? and that's the driving motivation for all the all the uh, turmoil uh, when we look at the gods, right? Uh, era, this hatred of family ends badly <laughs> for uh, Uranus and Kronos. Uh, and the love of family does very well at first for Kronos, but then especially for uh, Zeus and Gaia and Rhea. And you know, Gaia is in the background, the start, the, you know, the beginning of all this family to begin with. Uh, yeah, this creativity. Eros is also lurking in the background with this mythology about the races. The race that does the best it's the one that loves. It's the one that cooperates with uh, each other. Uh, bronze, uh, 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 silver doesn't do well because they don't care about others. You know, they're petulant little children. Bronze doesn't do well because they try to kill each other. <laughs> and iron will not do well. It's not really doing well right now, but will not do well because there is no love. There's at least not a love of people. There's only love of things. What drives success and glory and wonder and life and goodness, all of these wonderful things, what drives all of that, what is the motivation for and the purpose of happiness in Greek mythology is Eros. It's one of the three that first started. And it's the inspiration. You know, so you had Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros. It's one of the three, the, from the first three beings to exist. It was the motivation behind all other existence. Gaia did the work, sure, but Eros, love, is what inspired her to begin.